Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I'm Leon Slaughter and I want to welcome you to Innovations, a special four-part series examining today's world of agriculture and natural resources. On this episode, we are going to take a look at how AGNR is working to help improve human food sources. Researchers are developing methods that will improve the nutritional value of our foods by creating better crops through breeding programs. Currently, wheat is being studied with the hope of increasing its antioxidant power and helping to reduce human disease. Here's more. The idea that whole grains are part of a healthy diet is not new. The consumption of whole grains has been associated with a reduction in chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. It is the antioxidant power of whole grain foods that is beneficial, and wheat is one of the main contributors of whole grain to the human diet. Scientists at the University of Maryland are studying the DNA of numerous varieties of wheat because they contain differing levels of antioxidants. By mapping the DNA of varieties with high and low levels of antioxidants, scientists can locate the regions that contain the highest levels. These are called molecular markers. The markers can be used in wheat breeding programs creating the highest quality crops, or basically producing crops that have a high level of nutrition and disease-fighting power. From the fields to our table, improving our diets through science is improving human health. Joining me now is Dr. Mickey Parrish, Professor and Chair of the Nutrition and Food Science Department, and Dr. Jose Costa, Associate Professor in Plant Sciences and Landscape Architecture, specializing in breeding and genetics. Dr. Costa, what are antioxidants and why are they important? Antioxidants are phenolic compounds that are present in the bran of, of wheat and these are uh, important compounds for the health of, pe uh, of people. And they've been shown to, in some cases, reduce some diseases. So it's very important to look at these compounds in wheat. Could you explain <clears throat> the concept of, wheat of a wheat breeding program and how it improves the quality of wheat in our foods? So wheat breeding is basically making crosses of different types of wheat making selections and developing new varieties. That's the bottom line, getting a new variety of wheat in the market that has better yield for the farmer, improved quality, and also better disease resistance, and uh, also uh, other qualities that uh, we look in breeding, in, such as uh, agronomic characters that are important for the farmer. How does your work use DNA markers to improve wheat? So if to look at, uh, for example, phenolics of wheat, uh, we have wheat varieties that have high, high levels of phenolics and others that, that have low uh, phenolics. And we are trying to tag these high uh, phenolic wheats with DNA markers that are linked to these high phenolic uh, compounds. So we're making mapping populations between high and low wheat and identifying the regions of DNA and the wheat DNA that are responsible for high phenolic compounds. So is it these phenolic compounds that actually cause the improvement or is that simply a way for you to identify different varieties of wheat? So in our, in our varieties we want to have high phenolic compounds because these have been shown to have an effect in, in human health and uh, then once we have these DNA markers we can track them in our new varieties when we're making those crosses and selections, then we can identify which varieties or which types have these uh, DNA markers that are, will give us those high phenolics and improve the quality of our wheat. Now wheat is one crop that you are studying. What are some of the other kinds of crops that are also being studied at University of Maryland? So other crops, and especially Dr. Lucy Yu, she's been looking at other crops such as blueberries and um, raspberries um, that, are, that have high phenolics, also grapes have also high phenolics and can have that, get, that good effect on health. 
How will this research eventually affect the food on our table? So the idea is that we want to develop better and improved varieties of wheat that will give us better quality food and especially when we process that food, uh, those high phenolics will be part of, of the diet uh, th that will have an effect on, on human health. So we want to develop new varieties of wheat that have that better quality and improved nutrition. Now, you mentioned Dr. UC Liu and the work she's doing with some of the phenolic compounds. Um, and I also understand that she's developed a healthy pizza. Um, how, is her, how is that work going along and how does that impact food processing? Well, Dr. Yu is a faculty member in our Department of Nutrition and Food Science. And she has been working on antioxidants and incorporating antioxidants into food, common food products, such as, for example, pizza dough. Uh, she uses pizza dough as a model system for scientific research. Um, part of this is to try to increase the amount of antioxidants in pizza crusts that would be bioavailable, that could possibly impact human health. So what she has done is devised a, a method of uh, pizza dough fermentation and uh, cooking process that will increase the level of antioxidants, as I recall, roughly about 50%. So uh, by doing this, by handling the dough in a particular way and processing and cooking it in a particular way, you can potentially have an impact on health. Uh, when she presented this uh, research at the American Chemical Society in, I think it was 2006, she had a really large uh, feedback. We, we had headlines coming in from around the world that said University of Maryland researcher has uh, dis discovered or developed healthy pizza. Well, that's, uh, th that is, of course, in the eyes of the beholder in the sense that if you put too many unhealthy ingredients on top of the crust, it's no longer healthy for you. But from the sense of the crust itself, it's true that we have, she has developed uh, a method of enhancing the antioxidant capacity with the potential to impact human health. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the different kinds of work that uh, Dr. Lucy Yu is also involved in? Sure. Uh, Dr. Yu is working on a variety of different products such as berry seeds, raspberries, uh, blueberries, uh, grape seeds, and she's extracting antioxidants. She's looking at the usefulness of these uh, products, which are, are byproducts. They're actually waste products from, from food processing, and they would be uh, typically fed to uh, livestock or else, or else put in a landfill. So, uh, she's able to uh, look at these byproducts, extract antioxidants from them, and then try to incorporate them into common food products. Again, things like the pizza dough crust that we just talked about, or possibly muffins or breads. Um, there are uh, potential usefulness, useful uh, uses for things like uh, seed flowers and seed oils. You know, you can go to the store and buy some of these gourmet oil products that are extracted from seeds. For example, you can buy grape seed oil. And I, I use it sometimes in salad dressings and for cooking and things of that nature. And uh, it's, uh, these are potential useful sources of antioxidants that could be used in food products to have an impact on human health and Dr. Yu is uh, exploring those as a possible source of, uh, of uh, supplements for the human diet. Now, Dr. Yu's work seems to be adaptive or applied in nature. What types of more basic research are also taking place in your department? Well, we have uh, uh, another uh, assistant professor, Dr. Wen Sing Ching. Dr. Ching is working in the area of the impact of selenium on DNA repair. Uh, this general area we call nutrigenomics. It's the impact of nutrients in the diet on the human genome and the expression of genes. 
So his particular area of research is with another antioxidant called selenium and how selenium impacts the ability of DNA to repair itself after there's been some damage. As you know, DNA is constantly, um, uh, in human cells, is constantly reproducing itself. Every once in a while you have a little damage that occurs and the DNA knows how to repair that damage. So uh, sometimes there are problems that occur with this repair system and uh, this has an impact on, on health. It also has an impact on the aging process. So how, how we age can, and there is the possibility that certain antioxidants and nutrients like selenium may have an impact on the aging process. So that's the ultimate goal of his research would be to have that impact. Uh, at this point, it's more basic in nature. He's just looking at how selenium uh, um, impacts the gene expression. Dr. Paris, that sounds absolutely fascinating, the work that's going on there. Um, there it is. There's a lot going on. Dr. Costa, can, we talked earlier about wheat. Can you tell us a little bit more about what kinds of products wheat goes into? We're all familiar with bread, but what other products does wheat go into? Well, especially in Maryland, where we grow soft red winter wheat, and not only Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, grows soft red winter wheat that is used for products such as pretzels. And these are uh, very important uh, products for our, uh, our farmers. Uh, so our wheat that we grow in this area, we look, we look at the quality of that wheat uh, grain for those products such as pretzels. We have a big buyer in Pennsylvania called uh, Snyder's of Hanover, where they buy several million uh, bushels of uh, wheat every year to use in pretzel manufacturing. Uh, we're going to take a short break when we come back more on improving human food sources, this time by exploring food safety and its importance to the American family. For most people, agriculture is synonymous with farming. They think of cultivating soil, planting crops, and raising livestock. But in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Maryland, researchers and students develop new plants, improve healthy food sources, and create distinctive outdoor spaces. The college is finding ways to strike an environmentally sound balance between urban and rural spaces by reducing pollutants that impact the bay and protecting against soil erosion. They are also studying the effects environmental policies have on Maryland's natural resources and the economy. And researchers are studying food chemistry, processing and safety, as well as human and animal nutrition, health and diet. Students intern with federal, state and international companies. Graduates move on to careers in medicine, environmental law, research, teaching, dietetics and more. While the science has advanced tremendously over the years, the mission of the college remains the same, to use scientific advances to improve life. Welcome back. The research at AGNR doesn't stop at improving our food sources, but also helps educate us about preparing our food safely. Although many of us are concerned when food preparation is out of our hands, like at a restaurant, we should be equally concerned about safe food sources and preparation in our own kitchens. Here's more on food safety. Recent reports of E. coli and salmonella disease in common foods such as tomato, hamburger, and lettuce have led to questions about the safety of our food supply. You may be surprised to learn that most food poisoning occurs from improper food handling in the home. There are some very simple steps to ensure the safety of your food. Keep food at the proper temperature until cooking time. If food needs refrigeration or freezing, it should not be kept at room temperature for longer than an hour. You should also confirm that your refrigerator is no higher than 40 degrees. Wash produce and process separately from meat to prevent cross-contamination. Raw meat should be handled carefully and all surfaces and hands washed after the meat is prepared for cooking. Meat should be cooked to a safe internal temperature, 145 degrees for roasts and steaks, 160 to 165 for hamburgers, poultry, and pork. At AGNR, we are working to help make your food safer. 
Joining me again is Dr. Mickey Parrish, Professor and Chair of the Nutrition and Food Science Department. Let's start by talking about peanut butter contamination. What is being done to keep the contamination like this from happening again? Well, the, there is a big problem with some of the foods that we have in our food supply and the safety and the problems that occur due to contamination with salmonella. Peanut butter is the latest of the, uh, a number of food products such as tomatoes, uh, lettuce, and uh, certain juices that have had problems with salmonella. So uh, in order to keep our pr food products safe, we need to have strong regulations and we need to have strong ins uh, inspection system. Unfortunately, in this particular case with the peanut butter processor in Georgia, it appears that the inspection system simply broke down. Uh, and that is a problem that we have in this country uh, that needs to be addressed, and our, uh, uh, it, it, I'm sure that given the, some time and given some resources that we can count on our food inspection system improving. At the present time, though, we do have a problem in America. How is food safety regulated in the United States? I understand that there is a movement to unify all the regulations into one place. That's correct. Uh, I don't know if that's going to work or not, but uh, I can say that our regulatory system does need an overhaul. Our regulatory system has some problems. Uh, there are about 15 different federal agencies that are involved in food safety, in regulating food safety. The two primary ones are the Food and Drug Administration and the United States Department of Agriculture. Both the FDA and USDA have divided authority. That is, they're, they're not um, governed by the same laws. They have different laws that give them regulatory authority. USDA covers mainly meat products, mostly meat, poultry, and certain egg products. FDA regulates everything else. But it can get very confusing. For example, if you buy a cheese pizza, or let's say you're a manufacturer of pizzas. If you manufacture a cheese pizza or a vegetarian pizza, you're, you are regulated by FDA. If you are uh, manufacturing a pizza that has at least 3% by, by weight meat on it, pepperoni or sausage, then you're regulated by USDA. So it gets very confusing as to which regulatory agency has authority. That's why we need an overhaul of our, uh, of our regulations that date back to 1906, and we need to uh, unify some of our regulation, regulatory authorities into an agency that will have primary food safety focus. What areas of food safety are being worked on at the University of Maryland? Well, at Maryland, we have a number of different uh, researchers who are working in the area of food safety. We have the Center for Food Safety and Security Systems. We have the Joint Institute for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Uh, and there, it's an integrated <coughs> approach that we're taking to food safety. Uh, Dr. Jinghong Meng, for example, is working in the area of antibiotic resistance of certain uh, foodborne pathogens like pathogenic E. coli. There's a particular strain of E. coli uh, called E. coli 0157H7. So I realize it's uh, a, a rather long name, but the, the numbers and letters help to differentiate that particular strain of E. coli from the hundreds of, of other strains that are very common and uh, do not cause pathogenic problems. So he's working on E. coli 0157H7, as well as some other pathogenic E. coli to determine what is it that makes them per potentially more resistant to antibiotics than some of the other E. coli. So uh, his research is uh, internationally known, he's, he's very well known, and he's doing a, a tremendous job in helping us uncover some of the problems that we face with that particular organism. 
Uh, Dr. Parrish, you, you touched on this a little bit, but why should Americans be so concerned about food safety? I think Americans have a right to be concerned about the safety of their food. Probably 30 years ago or more, we had a fairly good food safety regulatory system in the U United States. Uh, in the last 10 or more years, we've seen an erosion of the number of inspectors that we have to inspect our food and uh, the, the regulatory um, activities have, have become more complex so that the regulators have a lot more to do than they used to in inspecting foods. Uh, the result of that is that um, uh, FDA, which is one of the prime uh, uh, regulatory agencies when it comes to food safety, has fewer inspectors, fewer employees, and fewer resources today to inspect roughly 80% of our food supply than they had uh, just a few years ago. So that's part of the problem that we're facing. And Americans have a right to be upset and, and certainly uh, contacting Congress, contacting the president and saying that this should be a priority is one of the ways that, you, that Americans can help create the change so that we can have a safer food supply. What is it that the ordinary consumer can do to help reduce the possibility, the risk of becoming ill from their own food? Well, the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that the vast majority of the food products that we consume and that we purchase at grocery stores are safe for consumption. Okay, so the, that's, I want to put your, your mind at ease a little bit, Leon, in, in the sense that the vast majority of our food by far is among the safest in the world. Um, things like canned foods, frozen foods, typically are, are very safe. Where you have to be a little concerned is uh, in um, uh, foods that are consumed in a raw state. And these use, this is usually produce items, lettuce and tomatoes, for example, things that you, you would consume without cooking. Uh, those types of items you want to wash and make sure you wash them well. And that's something sometimes uh, that, uh, that isn't done by the consumer uh, very much. A lot of us have pulled grapes right out of the bag and start popping grapes in our mouth without washing them. That uh, I know that you've done that probably <laughs> in the past yourself, Leon, so uh, it does happen. People need, to people need to wash their fruits and vegetables. Secondly, if you are cooking something that's raw, cook it thoroughly. Make sure, use a thermometer when you cook. Uh, make sure that you get uh, things like hamburgers up to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to make sure that the, the, the hamburger is cooked throughout. So really, um, uh, and after cooking and after you're finished eating, make sure you put things away. Put them uh, in the refrigerator if you have leftovers. Don't let things sit out at room temperature for long periods of time. If you do those, those three things, then you will, uh, should be able to avoid many of the illnesses and problems that people, uh, that we've seen in the realm of food safety. Now you, you've given us some really good uh, hints on how to keep the food safe once we receive it in our own home, but what is being done before the food actually reaches the consumer at the supermarket to help keep it safe? Uh, I would say that there is a lot being done. As I said, we have one of the safest food supplies in the world. So people should, should be reassured by that. We have seen some problems pop up the last several years, but I think that, that those are not insurmountable. Those are things that we can, uh, that we can um, address. But the um, retail markets, uh, the processors, they know what they need to be doing to make sure that, that food is safe. They are trained uh, properly, they know the regulations, and uh, the primary thing for them is to simply keep things cold, things that are perishable, again, the produce items, keeping things refrigerated, keeping dairy products refrigerated, making sure that things that should be refrigerated are not thermally abused is a primary method that our retailers use to make sure that foods are safe for consumption. 
Let's come back to the home for a second here. What are some of the more common or most common mistakes that the home cook makes in terms of uh, possibly contaminating their food? There are a number of things that a home cook can do to, to make sure that foods are safe. Uh, for example, if you are preparing a salad at the same time that you're preparing um, handling raw meat, for example, maybe making hamburgers, or perhaps uh, you're, you're handling raw steaks. You don't want to cross-contaminate. Uh, uh, a large proportion, for example, large proportion of raw chicken and raw poultry is contaminated with salmonella in the United States. It's one of those things that we simply, you, you can't get away from. So with that knowledge, you want to make sure that your poultry is cooked thoroughly and you want to make sure that if you're handling poultry in the kitchen environment that you're not cross-contaminating uh, with uh, salads and other things you would eat raw by using the same knife or using the same cutting board. Uh, you want to keep things separate and make sure that uh, you avoid cross-contamination. I want to thank all of my guests for joining us today. For more information about AGNR at the University of Maryland, contact the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at 301-405-2072 or visit us at the web at agnr.umd.edu. Join us for other episodes highlighting agriculture studies, equine studies, and gardening. I'm Leon Slaughter. Thank you for watching. Think Research Channel.